They need to read Revelation because we're living in the last days for sure. But uh, I don't know about you, but they need to sign me up. I said they need to sign me up. And if they need to sign you up, get up on your feet. Praise the Lord with these fine gentlemen up here. Come on now. Oh, my God. 
time we would like to honor a couple of our members who are going to be leaving us in the near future and first we would like to ask if Elder Charles Watson would come forward uh, please come up 
Yes. Elder Watson has been an elder here for a number of years. Um, at, how, how many exactly? <laughs> and as, as we've just been told by our head deacon, he was also a deacon before that. Uh, in any case, he's one of our very distinguished, very quiet, but very friendly members. And uh, we're, we're very sad to, to know that he's going to be going, but he's recently retired and is going to be moving to Georgia. To Georgia. And so uh, we just want to let you know how much we appreciate you, how much we value your presence here, and how much we valued your service as a deacon and an elder over the many years that you've been a member here. To show our appreciation, um, the Board of Elders has gotten this plaque for you, and it reads, it reads, to Elder Charles Watson, from the pastor, Board of Elders, and members of New Life Seventh-day Adventist Church, Gaithersburg, Maryland. In commemoration of your tireless service, dedication, and friendship, may your steps be always ordered of the Lord. And a quote from Deuteronomy 28, 12, and 13, the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure. Amen. And also, from the elders and many members as well, we have this card to show, show you our appreciation as well. I've been asked to say something, so I, I will keep it short. Uh, I think it was back in 1999 when my family and I moved to this area that we began going to the church across the street and over the years we eventually moved he across the street into this uh, facility and I, I guess the thing that I'd like to say would be more akin to encouraging those who are visitors here to make this a home because it has been a home for me for all those years. I went through some very trying times during that time, especially the loss of my son. And the church was always there for me. About 14 months ago, I had a heart attack. And uh, not much did I remember about it, but my wife tells me that they had to code me and everything else. So. I see many people in the audience who came almost daily uh, to the hospital to visit me when I was hospitalized. And so I appreciate that. Back in December of last year, the last day of December, I, I finally decided that there was no need to work any longer. And as a result, I retired and my Kids are all either in Georgia with grandkids or down in uh, Florida. So it seemed natural that I should move down to be closer to them. And I'm going to miss everyone. Today is not my last day, so I, you'll still see me around for a while. <laughs> but uh, eventually, yes, and I will definitely... Uh, let the church as a whole know uh, when it is my last Sabbath here. I thank you so much for your friendship over the years, for the encouragement that you've given me, and for just holding me up when I needed to be held. Thank you. Um, how do you surprise somebody who's involved in everything? How do you thank somebody who's involved in everything? We'd like Sister Simone to come up, please.
As she comes up, I represent youth ministries. We have children's ministries. We have Sabbath school ministries. Those are among the many ministries that Sister Simone has been a part of. Um, she has been a great influence to our youth in many different age groups. Um, she has been involved in camping, in arts and crafts, AYS, skits, children's story, and in everything she does, she commands a riveting attention from our youth and a, and a tremendous respect from not only them but from us too. So on behalf of New Life, uh, Pastor Defoe and family, the elders, and all the ministry heads, we'd like to provide you a token of our appreciation. I would be remiss if I do not say a word here. Here is an unassuming person that is involved in everything. And when our children are not here, she is here. We are going to miss you, Sister Simone, because you have filled a void in our Sabbath school. And our loss is somebody else's gain. That's how it is. But we truly appreciated the time that you spent with us the hours you shared with us and with the children. We hope that within the ranks, there are others who would rise up to the challenge that this vacancy has brought. Amen. So, you do the homework. Thank you so much. On behalf of Salvation, Sister Smith, I don't know what we're going to do without you, but we'll figure out something. God bless you. God speed to you.
on, somebody say hallelujah. 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 Anybody need God to fix anything for them? Come on, how fitting was that? Fix it, Jesus. Yeah, I think a lot of us would be out of trouble if we would let Jesus fix it for us. How about you? I want to thank them for uh, that timely word, that timely word through song. Uh, fits perfectly with what our subject is for our contemplation this afternoon. Fix it. Kevin, I didn't know you could sing like that, man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to we have to get some more work out of you, bro. Yeah, fix it, Jesus. Uh, some, some of you who know me, I, li I like that old school stuff. Uh, Curtis knows because I'm always asking him to play it for offering, and you all sing so much new stuff here. Uh, I like some of that old stuff. Uh, when I was a kid, my mom on Sundays used to have these old records, and she used to always be playing all these old records in the house, and so maybe that's where I got my old schoolness from because I ain't got nothing else in the old school but my love of music. Somebody say amen. amen. But I want to thank you all for that. I, I, I know that we have a lot to cover today, and so let me just get uh, right into it if you all do not mind. I want to call your attention to uh, 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, starting with verse 1. And for those of you who haven't been here for this series, we wanted to do this series because we th I thought at least it was very important for us to understand that all of us carry things with us that maybe we don't understand is really there. There are people, there are many of us that carry feelings or emotions that we don't really sit well with or we don't really, uh, 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 we don't really process our, uh, through. And so I wanted to have this series and I want to thank um, Elder Grigsby, also uh, Elder Brown and Elder Harris and Dr. Duro last week talking about anger. Uh, but this week I want to address this notion of depression. What does it mean to uh, be depressed? What does it mean to feel depressed? And so for these 30 minutes or so that I have left, I, I want to talk to you from the subject, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? First Kings, the 19th chapter, starting with verse 1. And let's read this together. All together, let's start together. And Ahab told all that Elijah had done and how he had done what? Come on. Then Jezebel. Come on, I don't hear you saying, so, and more also, if I do not make your life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a what? And he prayed that he might what? and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life. <laughs> Anybody ever been there? Yeah, uh-huh. Then he lay and slept under a broom tree. Suddenly, an angel touched him and said to him, what? Then he looked, and there was by his head a cake baked on coals. Are you all reading? And a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back and touched him when? A second time. And touched him and said, Arise and eat. Because what? It's too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food for how many days? That must have been a lot of food. As far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into what? A cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, God. We thank you that you love us so much that you have hidden in your word everything we need to deal with everything that we go through on this earth. So, Father, I pray that as we speak and we open your word and we deal a little bit with what depression is, God, and we pray that we will... Uh, leave here different than the way we came. And we'll be careful, God, to give you all of the praise, all of the honor, and all of the glory that will be due your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Let everybody say amen, amen, amen. amen. Uh, Lisa, we can uh, start disseminating 
uh, those as well as uh, those pencils. But when I was in college, for three years, I shared a room with a very good friend of mine that I grew up with in Boston. We had a very interesting friendship that was forged off of mutual respect and a constant habit of antagonistic pranks. If you ask anyone who went to school with us and in college, they would uh, probably tell you that me and my roommate, I won't call him by name uh, so that he doesn't get embarrassed by the personal story I'm about to tell you, uh, uh, anyone who knew us knew that we knew how to have a good time. Apart from the time that we used to have, we also used to have some very bad and somewhat disgusting habits. One of these habits was related to how and when and how often we would do our laundry. For some reason, when I was in college, I wouldn't do my laundry, don't judge me now, I wouldn't do my laundry until I ran out of underwear. Come on, who else does that? Be honest, shame the devil. Anyone else? It's just me? Forget it then, I still do it. All right. Needless to say, needless to say, all right, needless to say, my laundry. Needless to say, I had almost 80 pair of, okay, undergarments. So you would imagine the amount of clothes that I would have piled up in my closet waiting to get washed. It's not the same now. Denise tells me to go do my laundry when it gets too much. What was even worse was the men's dorm at Andrews had a laundry service where they would charge you by the pound to wash, dry, and fold your clothes. It was the best thing ever. But I still had the habit of piling up my laundry to the point of overflowing. I mean, I, I would not get my laundry done until I was at the bottom of, you understand, right? Because of all of the laundry piled up in our closets, in our baskets, in, in our bags, and even in the dirty clothes drawer, you can imagine that our room did not smell the freshest that it could be. I mean, once you combine the smell of t-shirts and socks and underwear from active young men, you can imagine that the smell could possibly bring tears to your eyes. It infected my room, my nose, and general well-being of anyone who dared to come to visit. The funny thing about emotions is, no matter how hard you try to hide them, or sweep them under the rug, or act like they are not there, it stays with you until you deal with it and process it, and until we get to the point that we, we process things that we carry deep down inside of us, our dirty laundry and our emotions stink up our lives and our relationships and our friendships until we decide to do something about it. It is unavoidable. Until you deal with the pain from your past, until you deal with your hurt, until you deal with your anger, until you deal with your frustration, you would think everything around you is smelling good and smelling fresh, but everyone will still see the stink of your dirty laundry. So let's talk about emotions a little bit. We all have them, and uh, it's been unpacked so many times that I won't spend too much time with it, but emotions operate on many levels. There's a physical aspect of our emotions, and there's a psychological aspect of our emotions. Emotions provide a bridge between our thoughts and our actions. They operate in every part of a person, and they affect many aspects of a person, and the person affects many aspects of their emotions. Emotions sometimes can control our thinking or our behavior or our, or our actions. Emotions even can contribute to sickness and can contribute to feelings of despair and despondency. Emotions that are not felt and released but buried within the body can even cause serious illness, including cancer, 
and arthritis and many types of chronic illnesses. Negative emotions such as fear and anxiety, which Pastor Graham will talk about uh, on, on, on the 20th, anxiety or negativity and frustration and even depression causes chemical reactions in your body that are different from the chemicals released when you feel positive emotions, such as happy or content or loved. Now, the other day, I, 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 Dana did something at school, and um, uh, to be honest, I chose, based off what she did, to be disappointed. Okay. And I made the mistake, and, and, and I told Dana that, uh, that, Dana, what you did disappointed me. What I did to her is something that I encourage every people in therapy all the time not to do, and that is pass off the responsibility for controlling what you feel onto someone else. And we do it all the time. You know, uh, our parents did it to us. Uh, I am not happy with you right now. And when our parents say that, or I am upset with you, or, or, or what you did made me angry. When our parents said that to us when we were kids, what they were teaching us was not only do we not control our emotions, but we have to be responsible for what someone else feels based off what we do. What it has caused is it has caused a world that is hell-bent on blaming someone else for what they feel. So you're angry at the boss at work. And you think it's the boss that has made you angry. The truth of the matter is you have taken what the boss did, processed it through your past and through your mind and through your thoughts, and you have chosen to be angry based off what someone else has done. Now, this is the danger. The danger in passing the buck for the feelings that you have is if you blame someone else for how you feel, you can never correct how you feel. If, someone's action, other, if someone else's actions are responsible for how I feel, there is nothing that I can do outside of them to help correct how I am feeling. Therefore, if Dana can disappoint me or if Dana does things that, that she chooses to do that are wrong and my mood changes or my feelings change, what I have done is I have given a four-year-old little girl power over me. Anybody believe me? Watch the text. No, no, hold on. One more thing. Let's do this. I think I got ahead of myself. What I want us to do is I have prepared an exercise for all of us. Now, the only way for us to deal with our emotions is for us to have an honest conversation with ourselves. Until you know how you feel, what you feel, why you feel it, you can never go from feeling bad, feeling gloom, feeling depressed, into choosing a different emotion. Everybody with me? Yeah. All right, so you have a piece of paper in front of you. I think I have one. You have a piece of paper in front of you, and all I want you to do with this piece of paper is this. It's very simple. Where is my piece of paper? All right, oh, everyone have one? Who needs one? Anyone still need one? Who didn't take one and wish they took one? All right, what I want you to do is, I want you to go through this list and I want you to read this list and every emotion that you have felt in the last 12 months that correspond to something on this paper, I want you to check it. Everybody can do that. I know church is not for exercise, but I'm in charge. Do what I want. All right. And God told me to. So everyone have a, everyone, does everyone have a, no, just what, whatever emotion that you may feel, just choose why you felt it, where you felt it, and whatever else I asked. Now, someone daring tell me how that felt. I'm telling, okay, I, if this was the afternoon, you all would be okay with this. It's Sabbath morning, just, okay. Anyone that has a positive or a strong feeling based off what they just shared or what just happened, just tell me, tell us, tell us. It's okay. Yes, yes, come on, just sh shout it loud. You were able to unload, and unloading made you feel how? Free. 
Okay, anyone else felt that? Anyone else had a different emotional response based off sharing what they shared? Anyone else? Come on. Don't be scared. How many of you all feel scared right now? Yes, ma'am. Weird. Why so? Yeah. Yeah. But how free was it that you didn't? Were you able to be honest because you didn't know the person? And if you never come back here again, thank you for visiting with us. You'll never have to see her again, right? So it made you feel what? Free. Huh? No more? All right. So hopefully what that exercise did was not only uh, make you discover or think about the things that you're feeling, but it made them present with you. Now, I don't want anyone to put that sheet away. I want you to look at the gamut of emotions as we talk about the text. All right? The Bible tells us in 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, that this great prophet Elijah finds himself in a place that it does not seem like a person or a man of God should be. If you take a look at the context of the text, as we encounter the text, Elijah had just gotten off of Mount Carmel, where he took on the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah and called down fire from heaven and won a great victory over Ahab and his terrible wife Jezebel. That's the context. And the Bible tells us as we encounter verse 1 in the book of, in, in the 19th chapter, that Jezebel sends a message to Elijah that she was going to wipe him out by days in. And the Bible tells us that here Elijah, this, this, this powerful man of God, retreats to a cave. He's by himself, and he, he sits down, and the first thing that God says to Elijah, if you would, if you would put up verse 9, if you put up verse 9, the Bible says uh, that Elijah, he, he, he went there into a cave and spent the night in that place, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And for the 15 minutes that we have left, I, I want to just frame this with these two implied questions here in the text. The first is, one, how, Elijah, did you get here? You can leave the verse up. How, Elijah, did you get here? And the second implication is, Elijah, why in the world are you still here? What are you doing here, depressed, Elijah, anointed but afraid? What are you doing? You, 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 you're daring, yet you're depressed. You, 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 you're, you're holy, yet you're sitting here in the corner humiliated. What are you doing here, Elijah? And how did you get here? How did Elijah, this man of God, end up depressed and running for his life? And I imagine that there's so many of us uh, under the sound of my voice that has ever felt the sting of depression felt the sting of, of, of constant gloom, not just the blues, but for extended periods of time, you felt like uh, there, was, uh, there was no need to get up. You felt like there was darkness just surrounding you. You felt like you didn't want to get out of your bed, or you felt like uh, uh, you didn't want to go and do your normal activities. I'm sure there are many of us that have been at this place where you are depressed and despondent and discouraged. And if you've ever been at this place, you can identify with Elijah, uh, with, with Elijah because here Elijah is depressed and running for his life and he's scared and alone. In the text we encounter two Elijahs. One is bold and daring and courageous and the other is moody and depressed and paranoid or even afraid. He's courageous but Elijah has a weakness. And Elijah's weakness, and when you think about it, is how in the world could a man that could kill 450 prophets of Baal, how in the world could someone who, who can call down fire from heaven be in this cave, sitting in the corner, sucking his thumb, feeling sorry for himself? How in the world in chapter 18 can he be so courageous and in chapter 19 be so cowardly? 
and chapter 18 and 19 have to somehow go together. See, one describes his outward struggle that he's dealing with. He's dealing with national apostasy. And the other deals with his inner struggle or his inner faith. Verse 18 is his outside battle. Verse 19 is his inside battle. And the truth of the matter is many of us, we can fight battles on the outside. But when it comes to fighting the person in the mirror, it gets a lot more difficult. A lot of us can be daring and bold and courageous when we're fighting on the outside. But when it comes to dealing with what's on the inside, who I am, what I do, what I believe, what I value, then all of a sudden, because the enemy is not external but internal, we cower. We get afraid. We get anxious. How in the world is Elijah here suicidal? On the brink of asking God literally in verse 4 to take his life. How did he get here? The first thing that I see in the text, and I'll go through very quickly. The first thing I see in the text is, uh, take a look at it. Uh, uh, in verse 3. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. And he went to Beersheba, 120 miles from where he went, which belongs to Judah. And the Bible says when he got to Beersheba, he did what? He did what? First problem was Elijah was about to go through a tough period in his life, and he decided to go through it alone. This is the same servant that was with him when he called down fire from heaven. This was the same servant that was with him as he experienced his life's greatest success. But here now, Elijah knows that he's despondent and he's depressed and he wants to be alone. The problem with this is all of us have an innate need or God-given need to socialize with other human beings. You can take the most introverted or shy or loner type of person in the world, and if they're going to be happy and healthy, they at least have to have one person to talk to. All of us need someone who we can talk to. And I'm not talking about that fake church stuff where, you know, if I ask you what's going on, you know, this is something people don't ever do. If I were to ask you what's going on, what will you tell me? Uh, 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 Elder, Elder, Elder uh, Ellison, how are you doing? Fine. Let me ask you a question, Ellison. Are you really doing fine? So then why, if I ask you how you're doing, do you tell me that you're fine? Oh, the problem with being by yourself is you get a chance to isolate yourself where you don't have to deal with the shame of carrying the things that you're really carrying. When you're by yourself and you isolate yourself, one thing no one is around to do is to ask you your business. So you can keep it to yourself, so that you can continue to stew on whatever is wrong uh, with you. But, but, but some of us, we isolate ourselves because we're ashamed, aren't we? We're ashamed, like Sister Defoe said, we're, we're ashamed to share because we don't want people to really know what we're going through. We don't want people, as Elder, as Elder Dorsey just said, to judge us. We don't want people, when we tell them we're feeling a certain way, to think that we're always there. We don't want to share that we've made a mistake because then people will think, oh, well, he's doing that all the time. Something must be wrong with him. And so when we come into church and get around church folk and get into the house of God where people should be around us to encourage us, we greet everybody, oh, we're fine. Oh, happy Sabbath, God is good. Isn't he pleasant? Oh, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Oh, well, I'm here another day. People ask us how we're doing, and we lie. And the truth of the matter is we find it so easy to lie because every day we wake up and we lie to ourselves and tell ourselves, look, we are fine. We don't have to deal with it. We don't have to sit with what we feel so that we can discover why we feel it how we felt that way, and take the responsibility to release it. So he's isolated. That's the first thing that I see. He, he's, he's by himself. And the, probably the worst thing about being by yourself, especially when you're depressed or especially when you're down, is when you're by yourself, the only person you have to listen to is yourself. 
And oftentimes what comes out when you're by yourself trying to encourage yourself, but yourself is the problem, usually what comes out is your dysfunctional self. Usually what comes out is your genealogical dis dysfunctions where your affinities to certain habits and certain behaviors. That's what comes out when you are talking to yourself or taking your own advice. The only thing that you can get when you're feeling dumb is dumb advice if you're giving it to yourself. All right. So the first thing I see is that he was alone. The second thing that I see that got him into this place is Elijah was tired. The Bible says that uh, uh, he ran down the mountain in front of Ahab's uh, cart and God somehow gave Elijah like super duper strength, like Usain Bolt to the 10th power of speed and, and he outran Ahab's carriage and the Bible tells us he goes 120 miles to Beersheba all the way down to the tip of the southern kingdom so Ahab can't reach him. And the Bible says that he finds himself by a broom tree and he's asleep. Now watch this. Elijah's mood, uh, Elijah's mood of depression follows the, ex the, 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 the excitement of his triumph. Elijah has suffered an emotional letdown. He, he's exhausted and he's by himself and he's literally running down the mountain uh, because, uh, uh, because he's lost perspective of what his true job was supposed to be. Elijah is upset and in this position not because he is afraid of Jezebel. I don't want anyone to ever preach a message and tell you that Elijah was afraid because some woman was threatening him. He was not afraid because of Jezebel. He ran to this cave because Elijah thought that after the time of his greatest victory, it was going to prick the heart of Ahab and Jezebel and they would change. He got here because he was professionally unsuccessful. He got here because he thought he should be making changes in people's lives and he realized that his life apparently was worthless. And here Elijah is upset, but he's here because of success. He just killed 50 prophets and he, 450 prophets and he thought people would come to Jesus or come to God and here they were, they were threatening him or, or here they were, they were trying to kill him and Elijah couldn't understand why in the world would I do all this stuff for God and have all this success and still people will be threatening my life. The Bible tells us that the, the, the angel comes and the angel tells him that, that in, in verse 5, then he slept and lay under a broom tree and suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Then he looked and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and the Bible says Elijah ate and he went back asleep. The angel touched him again and the angel not only woke him back up, but he fed him again. And the Bible tells us that Elijah went back to sleep. And one of the, downs, one of the uh, symptoms of people who are depressed is they can sleep for 20 hours and feel like they never even got any rest. Because while their body is asleep, uh, when they wake up, their mind tells them, oh no, you can't handle what's going to face you. You should go back to bed. And when they go back to bed, uh, their subconscious mind does everything within their body to make sure that they cannot experience sleep on a deep level. So they stay constantly awake and they stay chasing after rest. Here Elijah is chasing after rest because his heart is broken. He's depressed. He's despondent, and he doesn't know what to do. Okay, we have to get out of here. All right. All right. The Bible says that there he went into a cave. And, I, and, and the Hebrew has a nuance here. It's not just, uh, it's not just a, a regular cave, but there's a definite article before it. So it's not a cave. He went to the cave. You know, the cave where, the cave where, uh, on, on, or with the cave where um, God hid Moses in the cleft of the rock and just passed by him. This is, this is that mountain. He went to the cave. And, and the Bible tells us that here, Elijah is waiting to hear something from God. Now notice God's reaction to Elijah. God does not say to Elijah, Elijah, don't you know that you have a good God? God does not say to Elijah, don't you know that I am in charge? God says to Elijah, what are you doing here? Look at verse 10. Look at verse 10. 
I got to go quick. It's in the next set slide. Look at verse 10. So he said, Elijah complains, I, um, uh, uh, I killed all your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. They seek to take my life. Verse 11. Then God said, go out and stand before the mountain of the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. All right, we'll get back to that. Verse 12. And after that, a fire and then a still small voice. Then the Lord said to him, go back to verse 15. Then the Lord said to him in verse 15. Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. And then look at this, verse 16. Look what he says. He says, and you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nemishai, as king over Israel. And, Elijah the, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel and Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Now look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Elijah is upset. He says to God, God... Kill me because I'm no good. I'm worthless. And God doesn't tell him, Elijah, you have a good God. You know, have you ever um, gone to church people and expressed to them how you feel and they tell you things that don't really help? Let me give you an example. So you come to someone and you say, you know, I'm hurting. And they think they're encouraging you by saying, oh, oh, don't worry. <laughs> We have a God somewhere in heaven who looks, sits on high and looks down low. He can take your hurt because he's bored on the cross. You go to people and you tell them, look, uh, 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 my marriage is breaking up. And you say, oh, don't worry. Um, God is in control. God can fix it. Now, if we, need to, if we should give people that advice, why don't you think God gave Elijah that same advice when he was in the cave? What did God do for Elijah? God, one, gave him some rest. And God allowed Elijah to process why he was feeling what he was feeling. So, how are you feeling? Oh, okay, yeah, Pastor, I'm hurt, blah, blah, blah. Oh, man, tell me about it. You know, someone told me, Pastor, whenever I talk to you, I don't feel encouraged. I said, oh, that's too bad because um, it's not my job to encourage you. It's my job to help you learn to encourage yourself. Because if I encourage you, then it's almost like a drug. You have to come find the pastor so he can give you a word of encouragement so you can go through your day. And, and all of a sudden, now I'm getting all these phone calls because I haven't taught people to encourage themselves. However, if you develop the habit where you begin to encourage yourself, where you begin to sit with your emotions, with how you feel, with what's going on in your mind, what's going on in your body, and you begin to process them, you can deal with them yourself. Because this is the problem, and I, I got to be done, so I don't know how I'm going to get to the rest of this, but I got to be done. This is the problem. This, this is the problem, okay? Because we don't take ownership of how we feel, we can't do anything about it. The Bible says, the Bible says, um, the Bible says that we are to guard, the Bible says that we are to guard the avenues of our heart. But you know, we can't guard what we do not own. You know, you, okay, um, Dr. Ashley, I dare you to go to your neighbor's house and install an alarm system in your neighbor's house. What will they say to you? They would have a problem with you, right? How can we guard what we don't own? See, the problem is we don't own our emotions. We pass them off as if it's someone else's problem. You can call Curtis and them to come on. We pass it off as if it is someone else's problem. But let's take, for example, if I was driving down the street and I was texting on my telephone and the car I was driving hits a guardrail, does it make any sense for me after hitting that guardrail to blame the car for hitting the guardrail? Does that make any sense? So why then do we blame other people for the way that we feel? Until we get to the point that we control how we feel, we can never really take ownership of our own lives. Case in point, if I wake up in the morning and I say to my car, well, car, where do you want to go today? Will that make any sense for me to have that conversation with my car? So why do we wake up in the morning and allow our emotions and our feelings to dictate how we're going to approach the day? This morning, I told them a story in a completely different, mes in a completely different message. And I'll end with this because it just came to me and God told me that I should share with you. One, one thing that I love is I love children's stories. 
I love to, 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 I love to take the messages that are hidden in children's stories. Uh, you've heard me many times read books of Dr. Seuss here on the pulpit or talk about Mr. Rogers. But one day I was watching this great, uh, this great show on YouTube. It was called Pete the Cat. Anyone ever seen Pete the Cat episodes? Yeah. Pete the, no one? You all got to get a life, man, or maybe me. All right. Pete the Cat had this one episode entitled, I Love My Shoes. Anyone has seen it? The story goes like this. One day, Pete the Cat has on these nice, fresh, white shoes. And he's walking down the street saying, I love my white shoes. I love my white shoes. Uh-huh. And then the narrator comes on and says, oh, no, Pete the Cat stepped in a patch of strawberries. What color are his shoes? The kids yell out, red. And he says, did that make Pete upset? It said, goodness no. He just sang a new song. I love my red shoes. I love my red shoes. Then he says, oh no, Pete the cat stepped in a pile of blueberries. Did he get upset? Goodness no. He just sang a new song. I love my blue shoes. I love my blue blue shoes. Then he stepped, the narrator says, in a pile of mud. And he, uh, uh, did Pete the cat get upset? It says, goodness no. He just sang a what? A new song. I love my brown shoes. I love my brown shoes. Then it said something else. It said, Pete the cat stepped in a puddle of water. And the red and the blue and the brown washed away. Was Pete the cat upset? Goodness, no. All he did was sing another song. I love my wet shoes. I love my wet shoes. The, 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 the narrator comes on and the, says the moral of the story is no matter what you step in, don't allow it to control your song. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but there's some of us who have stepped into some disappointment and we're allowing the disappointment to dictate how we feel. There's some of us that have stepped into some anxiety and we're allowing the anxiety to control how we feel. There's some of us that have stepped into some mishaps or some misfortunes and instead of controlling those mishaps and saying, I'm going to choose something differently, we're allowing the mishap and the mistakes to mess with our song. And the truth of the matter is it doesn't matter what we go through, it's how we're going to decide to go through it. So how do we deal with it? How do we deal with it? A few things that we can do to deal with it. I thought I had them written down. Here they are. A few things. Man, I shortchanged you all. A few things we can do to deal with it. First thing. We have to be open and honest about what we feel. I know that it's difficult sometimes in the house of God to share what we're going through. Because we as church folk, we like to judge other people. Well, at least you all know you don't have a pastor that won't judge you. Because if you don't judge me, I do much more than... No, I'm not going to say that. If you don't judge me, I won't judge you. But one thing we need to do is we need to create an environment in this church. And I know Dr. Dean said it last week, but we need to create an environment in this church where we can have honesty and openness. Where we can share with one another what we're going through. Where we don't have to worry that if we tell somebody our business, they'll run and tell someone else. We have to develop a habit where we can come and we can share with one another so that we can encourage each other. The problem with not sharing what we're going through is it requires then for the discerners to discern what's going on with you rather than everyone being able to pray with you because you would tell people what you're going through. The second thing is this. The second thing, how do you deal with depression? How do you deal with the pits of, of darkness that you feel? The second thing is this. The second thing is you have to begin to reframe in your mind what you're going through. Listen, all of us, we carry baggage, we carry scars, we carry difficulties. But if we allow the difficulty to define who we are, as opposed to us being able to define the difficulty, the difficulty will control us. Listen, just like Pete the Cat, you can take a look at the bad that happens to you. And you can sit around and you can feel sorry for yourself and say, woe is me, what, why, why is this lot falling on me? Or... 
you can find the good through gratitude that you're still going, that you still have. What do I mean? You lose a loved one. Many of us experience grief. You lose a loved one. And it's hard to tell people, uh, uh, don't allow the loss of your loved one to control your entire life. But we've seen that people who once they lose loved ones, they develop or start developing lists of what they still do have. List of, 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 of what they still have going for them. List of things that are still going right with them. It does not minimize the loss that they feel, but at least it puts in their mind that everything is not lost. That there's still something that they can be grateful for. That there's still something that they can hold on to. That there's still hope that is possible. And then the last thing I want to share with you. If, 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 if you're down in the dumps, if you're depressed, if, if you're feeling like, you can't deal with the darkness that surrounds you. Get help. This may be a little self-serving to those in my second profession, but you go to the doctor when your arm is broke. No one tells you when your arm is broken or you're bleeding to death, go on and pray about it. God is going to fix it. The beautiful thing about seeking help is there are those that are professionally trained to help you. Do not think that the load that you carry by yourself, you can deal with by yourself. Don't be afraid to tell someone that you need help, that you need assistance. Elijah shows us in the text. So those three things uh, I just wanted to share with you. But Elijah tells us in the text, Bible says that Elijah's despondent and he thinks his job is done. And God says, Elijah, not only are you not done, but listen, go anoint this prophet, go anoint this king, and then I want you to go down and find Elisha and anoint him to take your place. Now you would think that it was over for Elijah, but what God was telling Elijah was that there was a new level for him to go to. That even though you're depressed and even though you're despondent, it doesn't mean that God is done with you. The last time we see Elijah, he's being taken up into a chariot into heaven in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, the Bible tells us that here Jesus, Peter, James, and John is on this mountain. And there's Moses. And there's Elijah. And they're standing there uh, with Jesus. And the Bible doesn't tell us what their conversation was about. But somewhere in my mind, I'm thinking, why in the world would God send Moses and Elijah to come and talk to Jesus? And I believe that Elijah went back to this time where he was in this cave feeling sorry, feeling that he was done, that, Jesus, that God sent Elijah and Moses to encourage Jesus on his walk. That he was sent to encourage Jesus to say, you know what? I know the people aren't getting it. They didn't get it in my day too. Moses could have said the same thing, couldn't he? I know that it seems that, that things could be futile. It seems sometimes that things, uh, uh, that things don't, are not coming together. But take courage. Elijah was met on this mountain and was set up for ministry not just for the remaining time that he had on this earth, but was set up for ministry for eternity. And I would suggest to you that many of us, we carry the things that we carry. God wants to use the very thing that we carry to be a blessing to someone else. We're depressed, or we've been depressed. God wants you to help someone else out that has also been depressed. You, you've, you, you've, you've been molested and there's other people that God wants you to help through this difficulty uh, of dealing with why someone who should have protected them and loved them uh, did this horrible thing to them some of you are divorced and instead of acting like you ain't never done nothing wrong maybe you should encourage some other young couple who's going through a rough time so they don't end up where you are our scars are meant to be used to help other people go through what they're going through but first and foremost we got to be real with ourselves we got to own our emotions be real with them seek help and I believe 
in my heart of hearts that God will deliver. God will take you to a higher level. God will help you find the path to healing and to wholeness. Stand with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love, God. We thank you for your mercy. Father, I don't know who's struggling today under the sound of my voice, but Father, I know that there are those that are despondent, there are those that are discouraged, that there are those that are depressed. Father, I just pray as we call them forward, God, that you give them the courage to come down to this altar. Father, we know that we are responsible for how we feel. But Father, that's a tough concept. There's so many things that have been done to us. So many things that have been said to us, God. How is it that we can own the evil that someone else has done? But God, we know you can give us the power. We know you can give us the victory. So as every head is bowed, every eye is closed, perhaps that's you. Perhaps maybe you're struggling with something. Perhaps you're dealing with something and you want to just come get some encouragement. If that's you, wherever you are, just step out of your seat and come down to this altar. If that's you, just come. If that's you, if you know you're dealing with something and you want... A special unction of the Holy Spirit to fall on you so you can deal with it. Just come, wherever you are. I'll give you two seconds to start walking down this aisle, and I'm going to pray without you. If it's you, just come. In God's, in Jesus' name, just come. If it's you, just come. Whatever it is you're dealing with, no one's judging you. No one's looking at you. If you know you need to come, just come. Just come. Father, as they're walking, God, we want to thank you, Father that you are such a loving and such a merciful God. Father, for those that have come, God, you know their heart. You know what they're dealing with. You know their struggles, God. You know their pain. You know the things that keep them up in the middle of the night, wetting their, wetting their pillow with tears, God. We pray, Lord, that you would help them. We pray that you'll take the pain away. We pray, God, that you'll give them the courage to stand up and say that I'm hurt, I'm angry, I'm, I'm despondent, I'm depressed, and I need help. And then, God, I pray for everyone else under the sound of my voice. God, whatever it is that we need, we know that you have enough grace to cover it. Father, as we go through this difficult process of managing our emotions, God, we pray that you give us unsurpassed strength. We pray, God, that you will send your spirit to rest, rule, and abide with us to heal those areas that need to be healed, God, and reveal to us those things that need to be revealed that we've hidden or pushed down inside. Bring them up, Father, so that we can deal with them. So that when we're whole, when we're healed, you can take us to another level. Father, I pray that we hear from your lips when you shall come the direct speaking. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, we ask that you keep us faithful in the tarrying time. Father, we love you. We thank you. We bless you. We honor you. In the most precious name of Jesus, I pray. Let everybody say amen. Amen. God bless you.